This is Charlie Milburn for Hit Exchange Media. I'm joined remotely by Hit Exchange Executive Editor Eric Hibbs, who recently had the opportunity to visit IBM and learn more about Watson, the supercomputer. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Charlie. I'm happy to be here. So tell us more about the footage you brought back from IBM. It was extraordinary visiting IBM and seeing Watson in action. This particular footage features Dr. David Ferrucci. He's a fellow at IBM and principal investigator of Watson Deep QA technology at TJ Watson Research Center. In this tape, Dr. Ferrucci demonstrates Watson in a Jeopardy type environment and talks about how knowledge-based analytics and evidence profiles used by Watson could benefit healthcare. Great, let's watch. I'm gonna take you through a little bit more detail about how Watson works through a little Jeopardy game. So let's see. Um, Watson, what do you think? What kind of hey, you, you you European Union for 200? European Union for 200. So let's see. Each year, the European Union selects so capitals of culture. One of the 2010 cities was this Turkish meeting place of cultures. Anybody have any idea? Uh, let's see, Watson? What is this down for? Istanbul is actually, you know, the right, right answer. And you know, one of the challenges uh, in, in Jeopardy is the breadth of the domain. Uh, so it actually asks about all kinds of things. And one of the things we really appreciate about what we did here when it comes to dealing with large amounts of data is that because it talks about persons, places, groups, phenomena, com uh, countries, companies, and yeah, all that kind of stuff, you know, when you plot that all out, it was a very, very long tail phenomenon, meaning that it's, if you tried to build a specific database for any one of these areas, you weren't not going to be able to solve the Jeopardy problem. So even if you, you tried to attack the head of that long tail, you'd cover less than 10% of the data if you imagined that you'd anticipate all questions that can be asked about all that stuff. So the real challenge was how do we deal with unstructured data? Because in unstructured data is rich with the kind of knowledge that you need to answer these sorts of questions and to solve so many problems in business. How do you access and get value out of all that unstructured content? And what was interesting about the Jeopardy Challenge was it forced you to do that. Because there's no way you're going to sit there and anticipate all those various types of all the questions and build some database of answers for that. So we ended up with, an, at a very, very high level, and I'm, and I'm going to go uh, another sort of uh, layer, uh, uh, peel back another layer of the onion and, and a few more PowerPoints I have after this, but very, very high level. We take a question and we have to try to understand it. So we had that example question there. So we have to parse it. We have to you know, understand the syntax inside the syntax, look for concepts, relationships between the concepts. Uh, we have to understand uh, places, people, organizations, times, events, things like that. And from there, we get an interpretation of the question. Now, understanding natural languages are certainly not perfect. So we actually come up with multiple interpretations because of the ambiguity and the tacit nature of the natural language. So right from the beginning, you have to start to realize that this problem becomes very different than classic database problems. It becomes one where you have to struggle with uncertainty. Uh, and you have to deal with that intelligently. So you need intelligent algorithms that can calculate probabilities that can take into account the fact that we don't have a perfect interpretation of everything we're reading. So from there, we, from uh, those multiple interpretations, we generate many, many queries against a large number of sources, and we generate hypotheses. So in this case, you might have a whole bunch of different countries uh, that might be possible answers to this question. Each one has evidence that might support or refute that as one of the answers. Because again, because of the broad domain, there's no expectation that we, we have an exact database somewhere that necessarily answers this, answers this question. So we have a bunch of possibilities. And the next step in the process is to gather evidence that might support or refute those possibilities. And then for each piece of evidence, we have to analyze it, we have to score it, we have to evaluate it. So imagine a passage or a number of passages or some facts from a database plus some passages. And now we have hundreds of algorithms that look at this data from very different dimensions and score whether or not that evidence supports that answer. So that's what's going on inside Watson. And then we have to take all that, all those scores from all those bits of evidence and weigh that. And we end up with something called an evidence profile, which is a very powerful notion. For each um, category of evidence, we, we, we weigh those scores that came back from all those algorithms. Now, I'm going to get into it a little, in a little bit more detail uh, uh, after this, uh, this, the, the, this little three-question Jeopardy game. But the thing I want you to start thinking about is medicine. 
uh, what, what you see here, what's really happening here, in spite of the fact that Watson got up and played a Jeopardy game, you know, question and answer out, what was really going on was it was doing a form of differential diagnosis. It was generating many different possibilities, treating them as independent hypotheses. And then for each of those hypotheses, it's going out and it's collecting all sorts of evidence, analyzing and organizing and scoring that evidence in support of each of those independent hypotheses. So this is a very general paradigm okay, for, for trying to, to do differential diagnosis, but not just for coming up with, um, with what might be wrong, but also for assessing treatments. What evidence suggests that this treatment might be a better, better than another treatment? So here we, 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 drill, we drill down into this evidence profile, and we see the different dimensions of evidence, document support, logical justification, popularity, source reliability, temporal or time, type manager classification. These are just some of the dimensions of evidence that we use to analyze the uh, support uh, for, different, uh, for different Jeopardy answers. Now, of course, on the game, you just saw that answer panel, which shows the top answers and the confidence. That confidence is linked to that evidence profile underneath, which is then actually linked to all the supporting evidence. So the other thing to think about is that um, Watson is not uh, uh, sort of saying, you know, I'm absolutely sure this is the answer, done. This is your problem, we're done. In fact, what it's really doing is taking the content that you've given it, and it's collecting and scoring evidence to help you the decision maker make a better decision. So this is about not giving a final judgment or a final answer. This is a, about provi providing evidence, informing the decision maker uh, more readily, uh, faster, and with better accuracy, with better precision, finding you the stuff here that really matters. So let's uh, let's uh, take, let's look at another question. Classic literature for one thousand. So the first person mentioned by name in The Man in the Iron Mask is this hero of the previous book by the same author. Anybody have any idea? D'Artagnan, I heard it. You're, you're absolutely right. Who is so, D'Artagnan? Watson got it. Watson got it also. What's interesting about this question is that, um, you know, Watson has to actually start decomposing language, understanding where it has trouble answering the question as stated, <laughs> looking for the sub-question. So here, it says, you know what, um, I've got to figure out uh, who this previous book is here. So he, it tries, it, initially it knows it's looking for a hero, but it says I can't solve that um, at this level. So I have to actually um, look for what the previous book was first. So reformulate the question to find that missing link, which is the previous book, which it does, comes up with a number of alternatives, the one it's most confident in its three musketeers, puts that back into the context of the question formulates the other question now with Three Musketeers and actually solves that and gets D'Artagnan. So you see that you know, in order to deal with natural language, in order to deal with complex expressions of problems, sometimes you have to break it down, find the sub-problems, uh, get those opaque references, what we call those missing links, put them back in, and then you know, gather more evidence. Part of the reason it knows to do this is one, how the, how the data arrives at Watson, but also because it tries multiple ways of solving it. So it realizes that, you know what, I'm not getting anywhere productive, I'm not producing a high enough confidence, so now I have to try another strategy and break the problem up, try to you know, get that missing link or that opaque reference and try again. So this is what's going on inside of Watson. Let's look at another clue. Medicine for 800. So streptococci caused this childhood fever characterized by a bright red rash and a high temperature. It's an easy one, anyway. Scarlet fever, that's right. What is scarlet fever? And Watson gets that with a lot, a lot of high confidence. Uh, I'll show you a few more details on this in a moment, but one of the things we started to do was to expose Watson to more medical content. Here's another question. This disease can cause uveitis in a patient with family history of arthritis presenting circular rash, fever, and headache. In fact, Watson gets Lyme disease as his top answer. But the thing to notice here is now how the evidence profile is evolving. Because now I'm dealing with a different kind of content. I'm dealing with, um, I'm using many of the same algorithms. In fact, as we adapted Watson to the medical domain, we, we, we didn't change anything. We used exactly the same architecture. Uh, we took only Shakespeare and the Bible out because we were presumptuous and thought that wouldn't necessarily help much with medicine. And, um, but we left everything else there. And what we added was we added some medical specific content and some medical specific algorithms. And what was very, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, very encouraging was that architecture and all those algorithms was completely reusable as we tried to move to a different domain. And I'll show you how uh, some of the progress we made there. But what's interesting, of course, is as we had to 
um, adapted this for Mandy, the, the, the dimensions of evidence change. So now we look at what's the chief complaint, what's the family history, what are the findings, what are the demographics, what are the exposure. So in addition to many of the other things, the uh, dimensions of evidence that I showed you earlier, like time and classification and popularity, we actually started adding algorithms to address these other dimensions of evidence that are more specific to that domain. So again, when you think about this paradigm, which is one that says, here are all the possibilities, here are the different hypotheses, I'm collecting and scoring evidence, and I'm organizing or sifting, uh, sifting through and organizing that evidence according to these various dimensions. This becomes a powerful tool for, for informing decision makers. One that is a fundamentally different uh, paradigm shift from what we're used to, which is a list of hundreds of thousands of documents. Right, so this, this is, I think, uh, can be transformative in that regard. So I want to actually dig in a little bit into healthcare. So if you could switch to uh, my slides. Is this my clicker? Green. I mean, green means go. So let's try that. Um, yeah, so this is a, a high level picture of that architecture. One of the things I want to point out uh, mostly about this is that this um, architecture was designed at the outset to be what we call embarrassingly parallel. Um, so which means that it's going to scale very effectively, both over big data as well as many, many algorithms. Because when it does, when it does these searches and it generates these different possibilities, for example, the, uh, uh, the different elements of a, a differential diagnosis or different possibilities for a treatment, it's taking each one of those and it's treating them independently, which means it can go out and it can collect evidence. So what's actually happening here is we start from a question, we look at hundreds of sources, we generate, let's say, hundreds of possible answers. So um, each answer now becomes the root, if you will, almost the proof tree, where I'm going out and trying to find out, can I collect and score evidence that supports this answer or refutes it? Um, now it goes and collects evidence. So let's say you had 100 possibilities. Uh, most people can't you know, uh, deeply uh, research 100 possibilities, at least not that quickly. And then for each one, if let's say it collects 100 pieces of evidence, I now have 10,000 evidence answer pairs. And at each uh, choice point there, I can go off and start doing this independently, meaning it's easy to scale. When I get my evidence answer pair, I now take 100 algorithms and analyze whether or not that evidence supports that answer. I can now do that independently for each one of those algorithms. And of course, I get some numbers. So now I go from dealing with a lot of deep analytics on natural language text to having millions of numbers. Well, we're really good with numbers, and we can combine those numbers very quickly. So now at this point, we combine all those scores, and we get you know, our, our list of answers with a probability associated with it, with that combined probability. And, and if that's over a threshold, meaning I'm confident enough, then it's worth presenting to the user along with the evidence profile. So that's the, that's the idea behind Watson. Um, we built this as a, 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 in a modular of sensible implementation. So this is, you see, a stack going from, uh, we built it on Power 750, which we'll talk about in a minute, which had very, very good scale-out properties. On top of that, Linux. On top of that, UEMO, which is an um, a infrastructure framework for combining text and multimodal analytics. So not just text analytics, but also speech, uh, image, and video analytics. And I think this is an important kind of platform to build on, because I think intelligent systems will evolve to consider more than one modality. Uh, in many applications, including, of course, medicine, image and speech and text information are all in, in, important in the diagnostic process. And UEMA supports combining all that sorts of that, all that kind of analytics. UEMA was created here. We actually contributed to the open source. It's now an Apache open source project. On top of that, we built a statistical learning framework, and then many, many different algorithms that we combined, we plugged in and combined in this architecture. Actually, there are hundreds of them, statistical and rule-based analytics. Um, you may have seen this slide, but this slide shows how good we got at the Jeopardy task. And the way to read these curves, we call confidence curves, it's a, sort of an important notion, is as you move along the x-axis there, uh, it's labeled percent answer. But what it means is um, how many of these questions, if you had to answer only 5%, these are the 5% you would be the most confident in. As your hands are answering more and more, you're being forced to answer more and more, so you're, you know, you're, you're answering those that you're less confident. And this allows us to draw these lines.